The topic that I've been asked to address tonight is historical materialism. Specifically, it was proposed that I should lecture on what historical materialism and capitalism are and what constitutes a historical materialist understanding of capitalism's development and function. There was, I felt, a certain ambiguity in this description. On the one hand, it seemed to suggest that what was wanted was a description of the origin and rise of capitalism. And then the other that was wanted was a description of what historical materialism is and how it understands capitalism as distinct from other ways of thinking. I will, in a sense, try to combine these two approaches here because they are interrelated. Historical materialism is, I will argue, a specific form of understanding the history of humanity that only becomes possible to conceive with the development and crisis of capitalism, and which then retroactively encompasses and seeks to explain the entire history of humanity. Because it is such a large topic, I will jump around a bit and hope that I do not do so too much and that the topic is exposed in several facets. This will not be a linear presentation, but I hope there will not be an excessively random one either, and that if there is any confusion, that it can be clarified in the questions and answers. So what is meant by the expression historical materialism? In one sense, it might be understood as a synonym, a euphemism perhaps, for Marxism, one which seeks to avoid the proper noun Marx, the proper nouns that the left often uses, Marxism, Leninism, Trotskyism, Maoism, often seem to detract from the underlying ideas and suggest fidelity to certain teachers and holy scriptures rather than sets of ideas. These proper names seem, what, seem somewhat contrary to a scientific spirit. In general, adherents of psychoanalysis prefer to be called psychoanalysis rather than Freudianism. A modern physicist, no matter how admiring of Galileo as the first modern physicist, would probably be taken aback a bit to hear her discipline called Galileanism. So perhaps there is some value in removing the association with individuals, no matter how great and pioneering. It also poses a more general philosophical approach and thus perhaps also avoids the narrowly political connotations of the term Marxism and some of the baggage associated with it. There is, however, another reason for not treating historical materialism as simply a synonym for Marxism. Most of you have probably heard and are familiar with another term that is related to historical materialism, namely dialectical materialism. What is the difference? Essentially, to greatly simplify a deep problem, the former, which is our concern here, usually implies a limitation to the realm of human history, whereas the latter implies a broader conception of the realm of Marxism encompassing all of reality, both human and non-human. On the occasion of Friedrich Engels' 200th birthday in November, I delivered a talk for the Platypus Affiliated Society on Engels' book, Dialectics of Nature. If you're interested, you can Google it and watch it on YouTube. For Engels, dialectics itself, a complicated term with several thousand years of history behind it, applies not only to human history, but also to the entire natural world of which human beings and their history are a part. This has been a controversial claim within Marxism and has divided Marxists in somewhat surprising ways. For many years, Engels's views were dismissed, particularly by the new left as an embarrassment and even associated, quite falsely in my view, with Stalinism. But recently they have been embraced by some eco-socialists. Another book in the Marxist canon that is both famous and controversial is Lenin's Materialism and Imperial Criticism, a polemic against the embrace by a faction of the Bolshevik party of the views of Ernst Mach. Because Ernst Mach, who had nothing to do with Marxism himself, was very influential on thinking about the philosophical foundations of the revolutionary developments in 20th century physics, particularly on Einstein. This latter caused all sorts of problems in the Soviet Union in terms of how to think about 20th century physics and how to separate it from its supposed bourgeois ideology. These are very interesting questions, but I will not be addressing them here. I raise the distinction of historical materialism and dialectical materialism only to better delimit the scope of our inquiries tonight. But we still have to clarify what historical materialism is. First, let us examine the second half of the term we've encountered in both dialectical materialism and historical materialism. What do we mean by materialism? 
It turns out that this is an extremely difficult point to clarify. One can look in a dictionary or Wikipedia and find definitions, of course. They say things like, materialism is a form of philosophical monism that holds that matter is the fundamental substance in nature, and that all things, including mental states and consciousness, are results of material interactions. According to philosophical materialism, mind and consciousness are byproducts or epiphenomena of material processes such as the biochemistry of the human brain and nervous system, without which they cannot exist. This concept directly contrasts with idealism, where mind and consciousness are first order realities to which matter is subject and material interactions are secondary. This may seem clear, but of course, one then asks what matter is, and that turns out to be an even more complicated question, both from the standpoint of philosophy and from physics. For although matter may seem to be the most concrete concept we can imagine, the idea of matter we discover on further investigation involves a great deal of abstraction from our immediate sensual experience. It is also one that has evolved historically and is not fixed. The matter of the ancient Greek physiologoi, of a medieval Aristotelian philosopher like Ibn Rushd, better known by his Latin name of Averroes, of a Newton, and of a 20th century string theorist are not the same matter. Furthermore, before any of these, there was the experience of countless generations of craft workers and farmers and hunter gatherers who did not yet theorize their experience abstractly, but whose knowledge underpinned the development of all civilization and made possible the later varied ways of theorizing matter, both scientific and philosophical. And it has only been recently, meaning the last few centuries, that science and philosophy have separated, just as it is only recently, again, the last few centuries, that technology and craft have separated. Both of these separations have occurred after the development of capitalism. We shall return to this point in a little while. But we also find that when we consider historical materialism, that the kind of definition that I've just quoted of materialism while appropriate for philosophy, or even as part of dialectical materialism, we must leave for another lecture the question of what exactly dialectics means, is not really helpful in understanding what historical materialism means. The definition I cited is ontological. It considers materialism from the standpoint of what is, of the nature of being. But materialism is also a way of understanding how things become what they are and can become something different. In this sense, historical materialism is a method for understanding the present in relation to the past, that is, a method of understanding history. It addresses not the problem of matter qua matter, but rather how the material conditions of human beings influence and have influenced their development. It is about the reflection of matter in human society, but it is centered on the latter, not the former. Although material conditions involve matter, they are certainly not reducible to it, because they are part of society as well. To understand how a poor person can starve to death in a society of agricultural abundance and overproduction of food, it will not help to understand the biological basis of agricultural nutrition. To understand the role of race and racism in American society, it will not help to understand the biochemistry of melanin. To understand the role of the internet in big tech, it will not help to understand the engineering marvels that make it possible or the quantum mechanical principles that make possible computer chips. Yet all of this is interrelated. The way COVID, for example, has so profoundly affected global society over the last year is tied to both the biochemistry of viruses at one level and the evolution of the global economic system over the last 30 years at another. The central idea of historical materialism was expressed by Marx in 1852 that men make their own history, but that they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but are under circumstances existed already, given and transmitted from the past. Unlike other animals, nature is not a given and immutable fact for humans. But at the same time, we are constrained by the laws of nature, which although we can come to understand them and use them for our benefit, we cannot alter it because we are part of that same nature. And perhaps even more importantly, we are constrained by our own historical past, collective historical past, which determines the structure of the society we live in and the possibilities that exist for the future. 
The accusation has often been raised against Marxism that it is a form of economic determinism. It is certainly true that Marxism emphasizes the importance of, economic, of the economic life of human beings. But Marxism emphasizes this role of economic life ultimately to offer the possibility of human emancipation. In this respect, Marxism is not determinist at all, but, all, but rather about showing how changes in economic and social history in the past offer the possibility of transformation in the future. There are other ways of thinking about historical change. One way of talking about history is to talk about the ruling ideas of a period. The Middle Ages, for example, are often described as the age of faith. And that is quite fair. But the Middle Ages did not live on religious faith, real as that was to the people of the Middle Ages, but rather on the hard agricultural labor of millions of peasants, which made the lives of kings and queens and knights and scholastic theologians and the varied city folk possible. That all these people, the peasants and the others, believed in God and a supernatural reality in ways that are hard for most of us moderns to imagine does not negate this other fundamental material reality. Ever since I first saw the Cathedral of Chartres as an adolescent on a trip to France, I've been fascinated by Gothic architecture. And even though I do not share the faith that produced it, I have a great aesthetic appreciation for it. But alongside that religious faith, which inspired these wonderful buildings, there is the tremendous material fact of the buildings themselves which are the product of the labor of thousands of anonymous workers over generations. In miniature, here is the story of civilization. On the one hand, it is the story of a succession of civilizations with different ideals and aesthetic forms of powerful states that swallow weaker ones, stories of great cruelty interspersed with heroism and pageantry and charm. It is almost entirely the story of literate minorities and political elites. Now, I do not wish to deny or minimize the importance of this history. Sometimes a leftist approach to history is understood as a kind of inversion. They tell the story of the elites. We tell the story of the masses. There is a danger that I'm aware of them that you may misunderstand me. I have spoken of a traditional history that told the story of political and cultural elites. I have juxtaposed that to another story of masses of people and labor. You may think that I am dismissing this traditional history as nothing but an ideological mystification. There is a tendency now in leftist circles to want to teach history from below, to tell the story of the dominated and forgotten, the subaltern. This comes from an understandable place, but unless it is tied to the traditional historical account, it can represent an equally distorted image. One wants naturally to tell a story of resistance, in the forgotten but heroic masses. And there's an entire genre of a people's history of X. But this emphasis on the perspective of the dominated common people often obscures the obvious fact that throughout most of history, domination has been successful and that for every act of resistance, there are a thousand of submission. A Spartacus is rightly remembered, but his story is one of failure and, under failure. and understanding that failure is as important as remembering the heroism of the attempt. So although it is a noble attempt to give agency and a voice to those who have been excluded, this type of history sometimes ends up reminding me of the Kafka story, Investigations of a Dog. In it, a dog describes the world without human beings, or at least visible ones. Food appears because dogs perform certain rituals which cause it to descend from the air. My point is that trying to tell the story of a domesticated dog without seeing the master's role does not really restore the agency to the dog. Historical materialism is not then simply a history from below or letting the subaltern speak, but rather exists to remind us of another deeper history, not as a replacement of, but alongside the traditional story. It is not primarily about historical justice and about letting those who have been silenced or forgotten speak, although that is indeed a worthy goal that I support, but rather about the plausibility of historical hope, the possibility that beneath all the cruelty of history, there still lies the possibility of future freedom. But we will return to this topic in a bit. I began by speaking about the Middle Ages. I meant, by the way, of course, the European Middle Ages, 
I'm well aware that during this whole millennium, which was not stagnant in Europe itself, that many interesting things were happening in China and India and the Middle East and elsewhere. But I'm using it as an example to illustrate the idea of historical materialism. So please forgive the apparent Eurocentrism. This use of the Middle Ages though is not by accident, but because the Middle Ages are the period that immediately preceded what is commonly understood as the birth of the modern world, which alternatively is described as the rise of bourgeois society. And this latter development is a fact of not merely European, but global significance. But as we know, the Middle Ages disappeared. What happened? Did people just get tired of all that God stuff and start doing the Renaissance and Baroque and the scientific revolution and then become ultimately us postmodern 21st century people? Is history just one damn thing after another, as somebody said? Do people think one way for hundreds or thousands of years and then just start thinking another way? Historical materialism offers another type of answer. There was a shift in the mode of production. A new class emerged and gradually became the dominant class in society. In the interstices of the feudalism that dominated medieval society, the bourgeoisie grew up and eventually challenged feudal aristocracy. Along with this change of class rule, however, came profound changes of outlook in every aspect of human life, art, philosophy, politics, religion, mathematics, etc., all began to reflect the rise of a society based on free labor and the market. Beneath all the cultural shifts, this is the deep story. The process by which this happened took many centuries. Perhaps the earliest signs of it go back to the 12th, and the process was arguably not completed, completed until the 19th century. So I must here tell you a very complicated story, but in an extremely abbreviated fashion. For example, you certainly know that the slaves in the United States were not emancipated until the 1860s, yet the US was clearly a bourgeois society and slavery, slavery clearly a manifestation of unfree labor. In the same decade, the serfs were emancipated in Russia. How does that affect the story I just told? One of the paradoxes of this rise of bourgeois society, a society rooted in a novel concept of human freedom, was that although it made Western and Central Europeans, particularly Western Europeans, more free, it also made enslaved Africans and Eastern European peasants less free. For concomitant with the rise of capitalism in Western Europe and its expansion throughout the New World and parts of Africa, Eastern Europe was plunged into a second surf because of the rise of that capitalism. Complicated story. I am not here, fortunately, needing to describe all the twists and turns of how first bourgeois society and then industrial capitalism emerged. I'm rather sketching it with a very broad brush. Now, one particular aspect of this long march to capitalism requires noting and is the central part of Platypus pedagogy in a way that tends to set us apart from much of the left, at least nowadays. In the past, our approach might have been more common. Starting in the late 16th century with the Dutch revolt and continuing with the British revolutions of the 17th century and culminating in what has been called by the historian R. R. Palmer, the age of democratic revolution in the late 18th century, dominated by the American and French revolutions, Western society was shaken by a series of what have been come to be called bourgeois revolutions. Although these revolutions can on the one hand be seen as the rise of the bourgeoisie and the struggle with the traditional elites, they are not just the substitution of one form of class domination for another, a view that is common on the left today, but also representing important advances towards universal human freedom. The left now is very skeptical of these bourgeois revolutions if not downright hostile to them just it was, as it is skeptical and in some cases hostile to the Enlightenment. This is unfortunate because it is ahistorical and obscures the context in which global modernity arose. Again, to make a long and complicated story short, in the 1790s, in the context of the last and most radical, and indeed the archetypal bourgeois revolution, the French Revolution, a new category emerged in human history, the left. If some of you are familiar with the Platypus Breeding Group, you may have encountered the phrase that capitalism is the crisis of bourgeois society. I would add that the left is the crisis of the bourgeois revolution. I suppose most of you know that the story about how the left got its name as the left 
is that they sat on the left side of the Assemblée Nationale during the French Revolution. I said that the left is a new category in human history. What do I mean by that? Was there not oppression before that and did not people resist being oppressed? Yes, but not a left. In the first century BCE, there was a great slave revolt led by a man whose name you may have heard of, though almost nothing else is known about him, Spartacus. It caused a great deal of difficulty for the ruling class of the oligarchic Roman Republic that already dominated the Mediterranean before eventually being brutally repressed. He must certainly have been a remarkable man. You may have seen the movie version with Kirk Douglas. At the end of World War I, there was an abortive revolution in Germany led by a group that called itself the Spartacus Boom in honor of the leader of the slave revolt of antiquity. Finally, in the United States from the early 1960s until apparently last year, there was an interesting and polarizing Trotsky set called the Spartacist League, named in honor of the German group led by Luxembourg and Liebknecht. Although all three of these shared a name and the latter two honored the struggle of the ancient slaves, the truth is that Spartacus does not belong to the history of the left, except in retrospect. Implicit in the idea of the left is the idea of an actual fundamental transformation of society. This notion is, I would argue, a product of modernity and capitalism. The general abolition of slavery was simply not on the table in the ancient world. It is capitalism, which both brought slavery to a horrific peace, peak worse than the ancient world in the plantations of the new world, which in some cases anticipated the murderous logics of Nazi and Stalinist camps in the 20th century, but it was also capitalism that made possible a general abolition of slavery and other forms of unfree labor. It did so, however, in the context of wage slavery, a different kind of unfreedom, which called for modern socialism as a response. Excuse me. Now, since I mentioned Spartacus, let me digress briefly to mention something else in passing that is relevant to our topic of historical materialism. At the same time that Spartacus was leading his great slave revolt in the late 70s BCE, a great poet, Titus Lucretius Carus, was in during his 20s. Lucretius would produce probably the only great poem on a scientific subject ever written, De Rerum Natura, in which he translated the ideas of the Greek philosopher Epicurus into Latin. Poetry. He explained how everything was made of atoms and their combinations. Often seen as anticipating a modern scientific worldview, this poem would just barely as a manuscript survive the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance and afterward inspire a new modern materialism. But we should note an interesting paradox. While a Marxist materialism can look back to both Lucretius and Spartacus as inspiration, one philosophically as a materialist and the other politically as a revolutionary leader of the oppressed, we must note that despite their being alive at the same time, these two phenomena were completely separate. Ancient materialism had no political character to it and resistance to oppression could find no sustenance in philosophical materialism. There are several reasons for this, but one is that the first form in which history became a critical category was almost 2000 years later, and it had an idealist, not materialist character. I am referring, of course, to Hegel, whose historical idealism lies in the background of Marxist historical materialism. So historical materialism has a pedigree that is in large part idealist, albeit an idealist, as Marx put it, that could be understood as an upside down materialist. But that is enough of a digression. Now I have to jump around a bit. I used a while ago the phrase wage slavery, which was the idea that workers were in effect slaves of capitalists, even if they were juridically free. Now an actual slave in the American South or a serf in Tsarist Russia was legally set apart from those who rule. A wage slave is not. A wage slave is forced to work not by the law or an overseer's whip, but by an economic system. Legally, the wage slave is formally equal to his or her employer. This is something quite new in world history. For most of human history in so-called civilized societies, and there were of course tribal societies on the margins of the great civilizations, 
or isolated on other continents, which were more egalitarian, inequality was taken for granted. Indeed, equality not only seemed an absurd idea, it was actively rejected as even desirable. One result of this was that domination was very obvious. For most of human history, no one pretended that the elites who rule society and that the masses who form the material basis for society were or should be considered equal in value. The ideological tension of modern bourgeois society comes from the fact that on the one hand, bourgeois society has by its revolutionary character undermined any possible traditional legal formal basis for a class system, and yet manifestly as a society characterized by class domination. This is the paradox that the phrase wage slave points to. The worker under capitalism is both free and unfree at once, and it is the particular form of the worker's freedom that also generates this unfreedom. Another way of describing this is that capitalism is the first historical form of class society the first mode of production to be an economic system. This is again, a notion that needs to be unpacked. I have books on my shelf with titles like The Ancient Economy. Obviously, most people in antiquity in the Middle Ages needed to work in some way. In fact, work very hard usually. Before capitalism, there were also markets and money in many places, although these did not dominate the entire society the way they do in capitalism. What can it mean to say then that there was no such thing as an economic system? Around 2000 years ago, the world is estimated to have had a population a bit smaller than that of the United States today. About half of those people are thought to have lived in two large empires at opposite ends of Eurasia, the Roman Empire and the Han Chinese Empire. Each of these empires thus had a population comparable to a large European state like France or Germany. And the respective capitals of those empires, Luoyang and Rome, were the largest cities in the world and both had populations of probably about a million, which while not large city by today's standards is even by today's standards, even today fairly large and must have seemed monstrous then. Apparently the city of Rome, by the way, did not reach the size it had under Augustus until the early 20th century. Both empires, although most of the population were peasants, clearly were large complex entities with sophisticated literate cultures. And in both there was necessarily, there were necessarily military and bureaucratic structures of considerable complexity. Because such societies were very large and complex, there's a tendency to imagine a greater similarity to our own capital society than is warranted. Imagine if you will then speaking to someone in the state bureaucracy of such an empire, trying to understand how they saw the world. Much, of course, would be similar to a comparable modern elite bureaucracy today, but one category would be strikingly absent. There would be no sense of the realm that we moderns call the economy. Of course, we moderns write books that project this category back onto the past. Somebody may have already calculated the GDP of the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago and compared it to that of China at the same time. I've even seen estimates of the supposed global GDP at the end of the Paleolithic. But such ways of thinking about economic activity historically is obviously absurd. And even apart from the dubious data used to make such calculations tells us almost nothing about the reality of the past. These are projections from a capitalist present onto a pre-capitalist past. They sum something about our present preoccupations but would have been meaningless to the people who lived in those societies. I've spoken, for example, about modes of production and described the shift from feudalism to capitalism as a shift from one mode of production to another. But people who lived under feudalism did not know that they lived under feudalism, did not have a word for feudalism in the way that we can say we live under capitalism. The concept of feudalism was invented in the 18th century and is a product of bourgeois society. It is a critical concept directed against those aspects of 18th century society that stood in the way of an idealized bourgeois society, which was still an emancipatory project. There is one particularly ironic example of this. Prior to the revolution, for some years, François Noël Babou was a feudiste, a legal specialist in feudal rights who essentially advised the landowners on how to squeeze their peasants as efficiently as possible. However, rather than allowing his position within 
the old order to cause him to identify with it, Babeuf came to resent the Ancien Regime's tangled and parochial legal structure, as well as the nobility who benefited from it. Later, Babeuf would earn the title of the first revolutionary communist. My point is that capitalism not only made feudalism conceivable, it also made socialism conceivable. Indeed, capitalism is the first mode of production that generated a sense of its historical difference with previous forms. Thus, in the Middle Ages, there were educated Romans who knew about the educated Europeans, rather, who knew about the Roman Empire and could read Virgil or and Ovid with appreciation. But there seems to have been no understanding of how fundamentally different the two societies were. It is not true that history is an invention of capitalism, but it is true that the historical sense that is developed, the feeling for past societies as essentially different from the one in which we live, is something that is a product of bourgeois society and does not fully come into its own until the 19th century. The past is a foreign country, wrote L.P. Hartman, and that is true for us moderns, but for most of human history, this was not sense. The past was like the present, which was like the future. Things happened, but the general framework in which they happened was the same. Tied to this newly awakened sense of history that came with the rise of bourgeois society was another idea that subsequently became more difficult to sustain. I mean the notion of progress. For most of human existence, people have had pre predominantly cyclical notions of time. This is the rhythm of human life. People grow old and die, empires rise and fall. Even the world might grow old and die to be reborn like the phoenix. But after all these changes, things come back essentially to where they were. To us, a revolution is something that changes life forever. But originally the word had the opposite connotation. It suggested a wheel that went around and around. Now, what I've said about historical time being experienced in pre-bourgeois society cyclical is not entirely true. In particular, the great Abrahamic monotheistic religions introduced a linear notion of history in the world in that the world and human beings were created and were headed towards the end of days, all of which revealed the will of God. But it is only quite recently that the idea that human society could progress in a secular sense has come to exist. This notion is obviously a precondition for any sort of leftism, whether reference to revolutionary. We take it for granted that even if we despair of its realization, but we should remind ourselves what a recent discovery it is. When I mentioned that feudal society transformed into bourgeois society, Implicit in that was that the transformation could only go one way and happen once. Many years ago, I met a young man at a leftist event who stated that he favored feudalism. Some conversation revealed that his concept of feudalism was very far removed from historical reality, and that what he really imagined was a sort of Luddite, eco-socialist, anarcho-communist society of agricultural collectives. But it's worth remarking that even on the far right, we do not have people who favor restoring feudalism anymore. There were some such people, at least rhetorically, a couple of hundred years ago, but not now. We have fascists, we have religious fundamentalists, but these are really products of modern capitalist society. Even on the right, it is understood that while one may admire the 13th century as the greatest of centuries, as a once famous book called it, that the actual social forms that underlay it are irretrievably gone. One can still be a Catholic or a neo thomist but one cannot restore feudalism. Even the worst reactionaries recognize that. In a sense, this is the unspoken historical materialism of the right. But this idea of progress, which was central to the rise of both liberalism and socialism, also ran into difficulties in the 20th century. Two world wars, fascism and the gulag, made the sense the general direction of history was towards a better, freer world seem unduly optimistic. The supposedly materialistic and scientific reasons that underlay this optimism began to seem like wishful thinking. Furthermore, for the last 30 years, there has been a sense that capitalism is inevitable and that no actual alternative to it exists. This idea has even consumed the left. We must then introduce a new historical category to understand our own time, regression. Those of you who are familiar with Platypus will know how central this idea is to Platypus, 
I mentioned earlier that capitalism had generated two historical categories of great importance. One was the idea of an economic system and the other of the left. But these appear subjectively in opposite ways. Economic forces appear to buffet human beings like forces of nature. Indeed, one of the psychological paradoxes of modernity is that human creations like an economic system and technology seem to exist apart from us and against us. They appear objective. On the other hand, the idea of the left introduces the radically new idea that humans can change the society they live in. It involves our subjectivity. A tension has always existed in Marxism between these two aspects. On the one hand, Marxism against various forms of utopian ideology has always emphasized the importance of objective material reality. It is not the idea of socialism as desirable that makes socialism possible, but the development of the means of production that makes it both conceivable and desirable. But socialism is also an idea. What happens if the means of production are developed but socialism as an idea is lost completely? This possibility was not perhaps adequately considered enough by classical Marxism. It is now definitely a reality. It is also an intellectual challenge to historical materialism. So let me give you a painful example from the tragic histories of two peoples that I'm intimately familiar with, Jews and Palestinians. How can historical materialism understand the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? It is not the case that events like the Holocaust and the Nakba can be understood as simply a response to the inherent logic of capitalism. It was not some inherent logic in capitalism that generated genocidal anti-Semitism, nor is it very easy to understand the rise of Zionism in terms of some objective logic or material interest. One can understand, say, the cruelty of the slave trade in such economic terms and understand its relationship to capitalism, but both the rise of racial anti-Semitic ideology and Zionism as a response to it seem to involve another non-rational layer. Trotsky once described Zionism as a utopia and a reactionary one at that, but clearly Zionism was not a utopia since one must admit, even if one regards it as reactionary, that the state of Israel clearly exists. How is that possible? One must think quite deeply about this kind of question if one is to continue to uphold historical materialism, I believe. How, if we accept historical materialism, are we to understand the ways in which ideas take on a life of their own? We need, it seems, to hold two counterpost concepts in mind simultaneously. On the one hand, the subjective realm of ideas, including political ideas, has a certain autonomy. On the other hand, to separate these ideas from their historical context and the social structure that makes them possible seems to render history unintelligible or arbitrary. It is not therefore the case that Zionism was simply a Zionist often claim, just the realization of a 2000 year old Jewish woman. No, Zionism was a distinctly modern project. It transformed as other nationalist projects have ancient cultural symbols and tropes, but it gave them new meaning. But on the other hand, it is not true that as some crude anti-Zionists have suggested, that Zionism was just the creation of British imperialism. What is true is that without the British empire, the state of Israel would not exist today. One might say that both the British and the Zionists tried to use each other for different ends, and that ultimately the Zionists succeeded and the British empire is gone. Similarly, with the rise of genocidal anti-Semitism in Europe, that was the dominant factor in convincing Jews to support Zionism, a project that originally had only limited support among Jews. It was not a necessity of capitalist evolution and would have struck almost Europe, all Europeans in 1900 as wildly unlikely. It is often argued that Zionists falsely understand anti-Semitism as eternal, but one is tempted to say that even the Zionists themselves could not imagine how bad anti-Semitism would actually get. Here again, the story is complicated. But one must situate Nazism, I believe, not merely in some abstract hate against which is posed a liberal tolerance, nor even less in the context of an ancient and unchanging history of Jew hatred and persecution, but rather a peculiar modern crisis of capitalist society and the failure of socialist revolution in Germany, in which the Jews became the scapegoat for a hatred of modernity, which was itself quintessentially modern. This in turn goes back to an even earlier history, the failure of the revolutions of 1848 
and the unfortunate fact that the subsequent capitalist takeoff in Germany and his social modernization occur in the political context of the reactionary political system and everything that that meant for the ideological development of German society. One could say then that in a certain sense that 1948 was a product of 1848. The distinction I'm trying to get at here is that between, for example, the historical catastrophes that overtook enslaved Africans and Native Americans in the age of European expansion and those that overtook European Jews and Palestinians in the mid 20th century. The first two are easily understandable, though certainly not morally excusable in terms of historical materialism. The latter two are not so easily understood. To understand them, one must understand them in terms of the failure of the left. In this respect, historical materialism has, although it sounds paradoxical, with the accumulated defeats of the left become more idealist in character. If a simplistic and vulgar caricature of historical materialism attempts then to reduce the complexity of history to only the play of economic and class forces and ignores the ways that history remains haunted by various unrealized possibilities, another ideological threat nowadays to historical materialism lies in the way of thinking that is in itself in a certain sense highly materialist. Whereas once what Marx has referred to as bourgeois ideology took an idealist form, increasingly it takes the form of a particular type of materialism. The key to understanding history and politics is often seen not in economics or class struggle, but rather evolutionary biology or neuroscience or the changing nature of technology. One can, it is claimed, understand history as an extension of biological evolution to which is appended technological evolution. Darwin can replace Marx. Like the emphasis on economic forces alone, this is a perspective that is not simply untrue, but which by exaggerated focus on one aspect and neglect of another, takes an insight which is true, if not taken in this one-sided way, and becomes a mystification by its reductionism. It is certainly the case that human life is part of nature and that we are a product of evolution. It is also clearly the case that technology profoundly alters the experience of life. Indeed, if one were to ask an average person what distinguishes modern life from the Middle Ages, it would be technology that would spring to mind as the obvious difference and not free labor. Here is another complicated problem. Historical materialism is rooted in the idea of social evolution and transformation. It then understands capitalism as central to the category of modernity. But capitalism is again unique as a social form in another respect. There was certainly technical progress before capitalism but it was slow. Capitalism, however, is the first social system which has a built-in necessity for technological innovation. The tremendous acceleration of technical change in the last couple of centuries is inseparable from capitalism. In this respect, a focus on either human biology or human technology, which pushes to decide questions of politics and history is a symptom of the naturalization of capitalism and thus conservative even though it appears in a scientific and technical form. Both the technophobia and the technophilia that are so common nowadays make the same mistake of understanding the central problem as one of technology and not the social order that generates it and in which it is embedded. The focus on technology and the biological state of the species, however, for all of its problems, raises another philosophical question for historical materialism which was not traditionally addressed by Marxists. We have begun to sense, at least since Hiroshima and ever more deeply, that capitalism may not be eternal, but it could very well destroy humanity. This adds an additional layer to the claims of historical materialism. To understand the history of our species in the proper way may be necessary in order to save it. Walter Benjamin wrote that Marx says that revolutions are the locomotive of world history, but perhaps it is quite otherwise. Perhaps revolutions are an attempt by the passengers on this train, namely the human race, to pull the emergency brake. But I've spoken for a while now and would like to respond to you, the audience. Thank you very much, Richard, for that talk. Um, we're going to pivot now into our Q&A session. Um, so once again, if you have questions, you can send them to the moderator um, in the chat um, and I'll, I'll read them out to Richard. Um, already we have 
one question for you, Richard. Um, did the popular understanding of historical materialism among socialists change after the Russian Revolution? And uh, if you, you know, the question is also asking, especially about um, during the New Left period, uh, the understanding of historic, how the understanding of historical materialism changed. I don't think it changed so much after the the um, uh, Russian Revolution. I mean, it certainly changed in the late 20th century. Um, maybe it started during the New Left. It certainly is something that has accelerated since the development of 1989-90. Um, so I think that the one thing is that what materialism means and the way the word is used has changed its meaning in a kind of academic context. So there is a kind of philosophical definition of materialism that I quoted. Uh, there's a kind of traditional conception, Marxist concept of materialism. You know, a lot of modern art theory uses the word materialism. Uh, sometimes people use the word materialism to mean concrete instead of abstract. It's often hard to tell what people mean by the word materialism. Um, sometimes, uh, yeah. Um, so I would, I, would, I would date the shift actually to the late 20th century. And I think that has to do with the question to some extent of um, questions of historical optimism. And the other, the other transformation that you see from the time of the New Left which is again, is that the emphasis, you know, for example, nowadays the categories of the left are categories based on oppression, right? So people think in terms of oppression and resistance to oppression. The left tends to speak a moralistic language. Like historical materialism is rooted in the idea that the left can understand history scientifically, right? And I, in my talk, was trying to both be open to that narrative and yet also sort of raise questions about, like, is history really a science? In other words, I think that there is a value in talking about historical transformation other than moralistically, other than in terms of just oppression and the oppressed, um, because that renders the character of the oppression unintelligible except as oppression. I'm not sure if that's an answer to the question. We do have a question here. I'm going to um, modify it uh, uh, slightly um, to say, uh, you know, given what you've just told us, Richard, about historical materialism, how do you think that we can apply it to our current situation um, in, in, in America today? Um, well, I, I think that, that again, I mean, the question would be, um, I, I, I was addressing the question I realized in a somewhat abstract way, because that's sort of the way I understood the question. So, I mean, partly that's a political question. Partly that's like what forms of political action are appropriate to the American political context. I guess, that goes again to the question of how one thinks about um, the idea of oppression and its relationship to capitalism. Like in a kind of popular conception of the left, what the left is, is a group of people fighting against a variety of series of oppressions, right? There's racism and homophobia and class oppression and sexism and so forth. One of the concepts of historical materialism, and it goes to this concept of capitalism and overcoming capitalism and modes of production, is that in the possibility of overcoming capitalism lies the possibility for general human freedom, right? I mentioned the idea of a bourgeois revolution. Now, of course, the bourgeois revolutions, as bourgeois revolutions have an inherent limitation, Right, and it's the failure in a certain sense and the, the inability of the bourgeois revolution to promise a generalized human freedom and a kind of new type of oppression of capitalist society 
that generates the modern left and modern socialism. But in both, all of those ideas, there was a kind of universalism, an idea that ultimately the, the fate of all of humanity was linked. And it was linked through a kind of historical process. So I, I guess that the point about historical materialism is to reintroduce those when some white people might think old fashioned notions about a general historical process, about, um, about um, universal human liberation, right? As a possibility implicit, not inevitable in the historical process, but still existing as a possibility because of the actual social development of capitalism. So, so the, the, the real paradox of the world we live in, not just the United States, is that on the one hand, capitalism threatens the destruction of the human species and in the meantime makes the lives of billions of people incredibly miserable. But on the other hand, capitalism has laid the groundwork for a profound transformation of the world, if we can only grasp it collectively, that would enable tremendous freedom. Right, and that's sort of the central idea I want you to get from this somewhat meandering discourse about historical materialism. That that's the newness of capitalism, that it, it raises the stakes of history to a tremendous degree, that it promises, one might say heaven or hell, depending upon how human beings collectively respond to the historical challenge posed by capitalism. And I think we have time for maybe one more question before we um, jump into breakout groups to really try to digest all the information you've given us. Um, this one's a long one, so I'm going to try to parse it. Um, I apologize to the question asker. <laughs> um, what distinguishes historical materialism from progressive economism? Um, and could you talk a bit about um, economic interpretations of history and politics in the late 19th and early tw early 20th century in that regard? Well, okay, so I'm gonna take historical materialism as being Marxism in that case. Um, so obviously economic interpretations of history have to different degrees been accepted by non-Marxists, right? It's obvious to many people that economics plays a big role in history and that's a commonplace certainly was a commonplace of historical writing. Um, the difference really is the global picture, right? That, that Marxism, in that sense, understanding historical materialism is synonym for Marxism, understands capitalism as a global stage of history that can be overcome. That, 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 it's not just about economics, it's about the total picture of society, right? I spoke, for example, about the transition from feudalism to bourgeois society. At one level, you can say, well, that's an economic transformation. I even used the phrase of saying capitalism is the first society that was really an economic system, but it was also the, the transformation of the entire cosmos. Every aspect of human life was in a sense revolutionized by the fact that the economic foundations of society were transformed. And that revolution, which originally began in Europe, then spread to the rest of the world and is now part of a global history of humanity. And it's that kind of global picture which Marxism really presents that distinguishes it merely from the recognition that many political events have economic roots. Right. You know, you can read about like, I don't know, like in the Middle Ages, like, you know, economic motivations in the Crusades, I mean, which were part of them, right? You know, the Italian city state, but they weren't the whole of it, right? You can't really understand the Crusades just an economic motivation, but that was part of it. And people can say that, and you can say, well, that's a kind of economic interpretation of history. But the real picture, the global picture that I want to emphasize is something much bigger. It's not just about economics, right? Even economics as a category, 
is itself really a category of capitalist society, right? I mean, as I said, you can speak about the economy of the ancient economy. It makes sense nowadays, but nobody in the ancient world fought in those categories. You're projecting onto the past a category that is really a product of capitalist society. And what, what is interesting then is to understand the revolutionary character of that transformation, the revolutionary character of capitalist society, which makes possible this historical materialist understanding of all of history, even the history before capitalism. I'm not sure if that clarifies. So it's a lot more than just, well, economics influences history, because obviously it does. You don't need a Marx to be a Marxist to get that. 